Festival Hall and the Reedville Fisherman's Museum Lecture Series. Uh, we're here tonight to talk um, about the Rosenwald School. Uh, it's a local school uh, that's right down the street and we have the um, Julius Rosenwald School Foundation of Northumberland County here to talk about its history, um, the restoration project that um, is uh, going, is underway and some general goals of the school and the foundation with the school. Um, and we have a, a group from the uh, board here to talk about um, um, this information. And uh, just before we get started, I wanted to um, say that the museum also has a small exhibit on the Rosenwald School, uh, now that was just um, put up this year. And, um, also, in the back, uh, we have uh, little donation cards um, for the Rosenwald School. Uh, so if you uh, choose to uh, mail in some donations, that would be great. Um, well, let me introduce you um, to you, the speakers. Um, first, we have um, Mary Jackson, who's the board president over here. Next to Mary, uh, we have um, Dr. Brenda Bullock. Um, then we have uh, Tom Kelly. And uh, last but not least, we have Stanley Norris, who will uh, speak. Um, and with that, and we'll have a question and answer period immediately following. Um, so without further ado, let's uh, get started. Mary? It is wonderful being here, and I want to thank um, Betty and Jean, I believe, who, Jean Hickey, her, who are there responsible for inviting us to come tonight and to give you some of the ideas that um, we want to do with this school. Uh, by the time that we are finished tonight, I hope that everyone in this room and others who may not be here that you will relay the information as to what we are to, uh, trying to accomplish. But I'll save some of that for the end. Um, Betty has already introduced the board members who are here, um, Brenda, Tom, Stanley. Um, we have Regina McCoy on the first row here. Uh, we have Marion Ashton and one of our faithful volunteers, Jude Kelly. <laughs> and uh, we're very thankful for the work that Jude does with us. So without the further ado, uh, we will begin by giving you the history of the Rosenwald School and that will be done by Stanley Norris and Tom Kelly. Good evening all. As you have heard, my name is Stan Norris. I'm a comeback here. <laughs> and I attended Rosenwald, Jews Rosenwald High School, in 1957. But I graduated from Central in 1962. <laughs> Now to begin with, as you can see, the school costs $11,143. And this is significant. 
the black contribution was $8,943, and the public contribution was $700, and the Jewish Roosevelt Foundation contributed $1,500. That is one of the main reasons why it's so important for me and this community that our ancestors, and you can imagine in 1917 what it took to get that kind of money out of the black community. And also while I'm here, I just want to con just get you thinking just a little bit about education, whether you know or not. In 1832, the General Assembly of Virginia passed a law that said blacks would not be educated in the school systems. But our ancestors had a, another idea. They said no. In order to create, as Reverend Marsh, who was late Dr. Reverend Marsh used to say, in the creation of a civil citizenry, you must be educated. And believe it or not, Jewish Roosevelt High School was par none to any school in this country. We had dedicated teachers who taught. This is not this. Not only did you just teach math and arithmetic. They taught geometry, French, even aeronautics. They don't have that now in the schools. But they taught it in 1944. My mother-in-law was in the class. Some of my neighbors were in the class. In the aeronautics class. And some of the graduates of Jewish Rosenwald went on to become pilots. Some of the other schools, I mean the other grades of what we were talking about the, with the math and sciences. And I can remember some of my teachers. You know, I remember cutting open the frog <laughs> in biology. Think about it. But yet, we made it. This slide is a picture of the original school. And you see, you see the fire escape. This design was by Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington and Jewish Roosevelt teamed up <coughs> somewhere around 1910. And it started when he visited Tuskegee. Booker T. Washington was the president of Tuskegee University. He wanted to build more classrooms for, for the students and more housing for the teachers of Tuskegee. So he asked, you know, he started looking down his list and look who was a philanthropist. He said, maybe I'll ask Jewish Roosevelt about this. Jewish Roosevelt wrote to Tuskegee and he said, yes, I'll be glad to. And what happened when he contributed money for the schools of Tuskegee, it took off like that. And next thing you know, in 15 states, beginning with Maryland to Texas, Jewish Roosevelt contributed to over 5,300 5, buildings. 5,300 buildings. And guess what? He didn't want his name on that one of them. His name didn't go on Jewish Roosevelt School until November the 12th, 1932. That came under Dr. H.M. Ruffin to change the name because they thought so much of the fact that here's somebody who can contribute to uh, the black community to be educated so that kids be educated. And this is a connection that maybe you don't know anything about. Most of the black community here were in the fishermen. Reedville itself, Reedville proper, could not have made it without the black contributions of our ancestors. They worked on those boats 
And they had to be, I think over, I was told there were over 20 men on those boats. This was before any mechanical things. Those had to raise those nets to get the fish in. But they wanted a better life for their kids. So they contributed the land, the timber, and they also, they cooked dinners and you, they did everything to raise money. And I hope some of you, here's a Sister Tolson that's sitting here, and she knows all about it. So if I say something wrong, I want her to raise her hand and just let me know that I'm not. And also, Mr. Giddens, uh, just let them know if I'm saying something wrong. But that's what it took to get that school. And to get it, in some of my records that I've been reading, in 1916, when they got the land, it cost like $325. And that money, all, the money came from black community. They didn't get anything from North London County for that land. That land was given by the blacks to build that school there. And that's very important. In that particular school, it was a two-story school. There was only like seven in the country. That school, the schoolhouse, that school right there was one of seven in the, in, the, in the country, in those 15 states, built like that. The rest of them were on a, a plan that Jewish Rosenwald came up with, with the help of Booker T. Washington and, and with the architecture design of the schools. But it wasn't like that. This particular school is one that's still standing. It's the only one still standing in the country. That's another reason we were working so hard to try to keep it there. In the original building, the elementary kids were on the first floor. The upper grades were on the second floor until about three years after that. Like I said, it began in 1917 when they opened the doors. But in 1920 or so, that's when the grades started going up to seventh grade. And they had to ask the, the state for accreditation to go to eighth grade for high school equivalency. Those slides right there, the name has changed, but not the purpose. Like I told you, the name was changed in November 16, 1932. We had just lost one of the oldest members, I think it was last year. His name was William A. Hudnall, and he was over 100 years old. And he was one of the first, I mean, one of the last graduates that we had. And we do have oral histories from him. We, ha we do have that. And one of the things that he did, I don't know if how many is familiar with the area, but William Hudnall was born in Hacks Neck. And to get to school, he had to walk to the river, row, sometimes row across if he didn't catch the ferry, had to row across the river, and then walk four more miles to get to school. And that's what he did. He, he graduated from there. And he left here, and he went to New York. And he worked up there until he decided to come back. But one of the things that he did, he said he, he took French. And he told us, and matter of fact, I asked them. I said, well, Dick Hunter, did you, have to, did you ever have to use that French? That you, you know, you take courses. He said, yes. I used it in New York because I was a, a, a stevedore foreman. He worked on the waterfront. And he says a lot of Haitians that were working there. And he was one of the only ones to talk to them. <laughs> so you see, you never know what that education will do for, where it leads you to. And I found that very interesting. These are the, Dr. Ellison, John Ellison was the first principal, and Dr. Ruffin was the second. I believe he came in in 1926, if I'm not mistaken, is that right, you know, 1926? And he came at, at, a couple of times he came back, because he was the principal when I attended there. And I'm sure Lacey, well, he was the principal when you were there, Lacey? No, I came between him and uh, but did not 
Mr. Bennett? I didn't have him directly, but indirectly, I didn't have him. I just wanted to know who these people were. This was Reverend Ruffin, who was the pastor of Shallow. And he was the principal that was the principal when the name was changed from Northumberland County Training School to Jewish Roosevelt High School. And he was the one instrumental in doing that. Next. 42 years of focal point. Jewish Roosevelt. was one of the foremost educational centers. I hate to say just high school because you know what? It was like a college campus. There was the big building, but there also there were science buildings. There was agriculture building. There was a cafeteria. There was a home ec building. It was a campus, just like any college. And that, that bell changed, and that bell went off, you changed classes, and you had to get there. You had to get there. And all that happened when I was there. Like I said, I was a youngster. You can talk to some of them older. <laughs> that was the building that the it is said in that in 1961 up until when? What year? 61. When the school closed. But what happened? A lot of times you see information that say it closed in 1959. It's not really true. It was the high school that the left, because I was in the 57, 58 high school year. That's when we left, but it stayed open until 1961 when they built the uh, Fairfield Elementary and Central High School. That was right after you know, when the integration had come by. This is a highway marker that you'll see out in front of the school now. In there you'll see, uh, they say they raised $7,000, but uh, on some of the other information that we got from the county, it was more than that. It was like eighty three hundred or something. Now, in 2004, Rev. Morris had this vision. Since that school was sitting there, just sitting there, and being a barn, there was hay placed in that barn. And I'd like to say that the hay being put in the school was under divine intervention. Because had it not put, if he hadn't, the slaughter hadn't put that hay in the building, that building been on the ground today. But that hay being in the building absorbed all the moisture we got because it was just boards and windows on that building. So with the hay being in, it was in, hay was in every room in that building. It cost the family, it cost us, well, I think about almost two thousand dollars to get it out. Because with that hay in that school, when I walked in, I, I'm not fond of slittery things running around. And, <laughs> but there were some people who went in there and didn't mind, so hey, you go ahead. We'll pay to have it done. And that's what happened. We paid to get it out. And just look at the condition of those floors and those walls in there as we speak right today. You say, how in the world did this stuff? for a building that's 100 years old. And that building is strong and steady today. And that's why we are all about trying to get it restored. <laughs> Reverend Morris formed an organization called the Roosevelt Tribute Fund. And the two Two people right there, Dick Taylor and the Sister Elos was on that board. In its, in, you know, in, its, in its inception. And he says, we're gonna do this. We're gonna be in it for the long haul. 
And he, he made sure, he told us, he said, don't think this is going to happen overnight. This is the process. We didn't even own the building. Number one, we had to get the building. And so, but, but Tom is going to talk on that when he gets here. Next. And this is the mission. And someone else is going to talk on it. So if any, that's all, we're going to save questions and answers for later on. But I've been told now, I don't talk long enough, and I'm going to sit down and let somebody else get up here. Thank you. Stanley, you are a comedian. And you did talk long enough. You said all the things that I was going to say. Um, my name's Tom Kelly. I did not attend uh, the Rosenwald School, but I do have my own Rosenwald story, and that is that I attended two the Rosenwald School. Um, I, well, before I um, launch into my Rosenwald story, let me just say that if, if you go away tonight and don't take anything else, uh, please remember this, and that is that our forefathers described in writing the American ideal, and the American ideal is that we are one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And we've come some way toward achieving that ideal, but we have a long ways yet to go. Um, this school is part of that story of how we've gotten where we are because education is the key to achieving the ideal of equal opportunity and liberty for all. I moved to uh, Reedville in 1967, when my father, and some of you may have already heard this story or read it in the newspaper because it's been around. Um, he retired from the Navy. We moved uh, down here when I was getting ready to go into my junior year in high school. And I had the good fortune uh, that year in 1967-68 to meet Judy Slaughter, who's sitting in the front row. Eventually we married, and, um, and I became familiar with her, her family. In 1968, uh, I needed a summer job, and so Mr. Slaughter put me to work painting the Rosenwald School. In 1961, as Stanley said, uh, the school was closed because uh, desegregation had uh, officially ended and schools were um, uh, built by the county for uh, the African American community. And Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Slaughter, Warren Slaughter and Lillian, acquired the property where the school is. Um, as Stanley stole my thunder, uh, Mr. Slaughter was a well, uh, businessman of, of many interests. Uh, one was farming uh, and raising livestock. And he uh, decided to store hay in the building because he uh, raised livestock there in the area behind the school. Mrs. Slaughter was a preservationist. Um, and uh, they were uh, lifelong residents of Reedville. Uh, in fact, Mrs. Slaughter was the great-granddaughter of Elijah Reed, for whom the town's named, uh, and they were very proud of the heritage of the town, its fishing uh, ideal, and uh, what it stood for. And they recognized that the school, which had been closed and they acquired, um, was significant in the history of the Reedville area and in uh, the evolution of the rights of African Americans in the area. And so Mrs. Slaughter decided to take some effort to preserve it. Uh, I don't think she said put hay in it, but um, she wanted to uh, seal it up, so they took the windows out of the building, and rather than just throwing them away, uh, they kept them all inside, upstairs, and those are now being put back into the structure. Um, and she had it sandblasted, had the building sandblasted and repainted. And I'm not, I can't say that I was part of that repainting effort, but I know I sweated a lot during the summer of 1968 painting, painting the building. Um, uh, there came a time when uh, Reverend T. Wright Morris, who was the spiritual advisor of uh, leader of Shiloh Baptist Church and probably many more people than just that congregation, um, decided that 
he would make an effort to bring the school back into the realm of the African American community to make sure it was preserved and nothing adverse happened to it. So he started a dialogue with Mr. and Mrs. Slaughter um, and they were very receptive uh, to the notion of making some arrangement by which the school would be available to the African American community. And um, they both passed away in 2006 uh, before they had achieved that and so uh, Judy, Jude, who is, as we call her now, uh, talked to Reverend Morris and I talked to Reverend Morris and, um, and during that time period, uh, Reverend Morris, as Stanley said, again, taking my words, um, said that uh, he, he created this tribute fund and then in 2010, um, he asked Mary Jackson to head up the, what is now the Julius Rosenwald Foundation of Northumberland County. And uh, we uh, negotiated back and forth and uh, the family decided to donate the land and the property to the foundation and that was accomplished in 2014. So that, that's where we are right now. And uh, the mission of, well the mission really boils down to preserving the school uh, to hopefully accomplish the American ideal of one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. We have a lot of work to do on the building and accomplishing that ideal, but if we keep it as an ideal and let it motivate us, then we'll get where we want to go. And Betty mentioned that, Betty mentioned that we had donation cards. Really what we need is uh, time, talent, and treasure. She mentioned uh, treasure, but we also need time and talent. So if you care to help out with many of the things that need to be done, fill out a, a um, volunteer form and send it to us and we'll call and get in touch with you, okay? Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Brenda Bullock. Um, I was born and bred right here in Northumberland County in Lillian, Virginia, uh, Richard Yerby, if, if some of you older people probably remember him, he's been gone for a while, but down on the corner where the big farm is crossed there and going down to Lillian. Um, I did attend Rosenwald School, um, and I kind of bring it to closure because I was the class that attended it uh, the year that it was closed. I was the last class that came through. Um, so I do remember quite a bit about the school. So that helped me to be very, very passionate about the fact that we make this happen and make this project happen. And it just happened that um, I have expertise as a project manager. Currently I am uh, managing an a, uh, IT mortgage loan system installation for Pentagon Federal Credit Union in Alexandria, Virginia. So a lot, a lot of project management experience and um, you know, the saying to, to much is given, much is required. Um, that was the way I was raised on that, that farmhouse and, and that was uh, the rules that guided us every day we lived. So you have to give back. So I stand before you giving back and I also wanna thank this community for giving back because we have had a couple of initiatives and you guys have risen to the occasion and I just want to thank you before I start giving you uh, some reports. Mm -hmm. Our phase one, first of all, the, the, the project, the restoration project is a four phase project. Unfortunately, we don't have the money to just say, let's do it. It has to be phased in and that is the approach that we took with the project. So uh, 2015 through 2016, we did the planning of the project. We got, and during that period of time was when we got the hay out. We had structural and environmental analysis done. Um, we secured the foundation. Uh, we did the architectural planning, so we hired an architect to come in and help us plan for our future uh, rest restoration project. 
and we came up with the different phases and approaches and timelines to make it happen. So we finished phase one, and we're now currently in phase two. Phase two, we're, we're working on the inside, pretty much. If you drive by, you notice that some of the, um, the wood that was covering up the windows have been removed. And uh, we've actually started putting in windows, and once the weather can get better, and that may be July, uh, we want to complete the window installation, and uh, we have a couple of other uh, initiatives that will be going on along the process. But phase two should be restoring windows, uh, floors, walls. Uh, we have a problem with standing water there at the school. We need to mitigate that so that, uh, and the county promised they would help us with that, so that that water won't stand any longer and we can have people come in and, and park. These are just some of the things that we're going to do. I uh, just wanted to give you a highlight and everything that fit it in one slide. Um, and then phase three, we will focus on the exterior. Now that we've got everything, the foundation is solid, things are good on the inside, people can go in and look around, then we make it pretty on the outside. And uh, it would encompass, and this would be uh, 2019, restoring the exterior of the building, painting the roof in the building, uh, getting our par parking area, uh, paved and installed and doing all the pretty landscaping that we would do there. Um, once that happens, um, we will be prepared at least to do some initial door opening and starting to have the public come in on a regular recurring basis. However, there is another phase which is phase four, which is very important to the success of the project and that is uh, the new addition that we need to add, and we really need to do this. That new addition would encompass the uh, bathrooms. We can do porta potties temporarily, but we would need to have uh, permanent bathrooms inside. The school does not have bathrooms. Um, we, I actually remember, if I, more than I remember anything else about the school. <laughs> you know where I'm going, right? More than anything else I remembered in the schools was the outhouse. And frankly, I had running water in my house. I lived in the country and I lived on a farm and we had an outhouse for when the pipes froze up, but I had a bathroom. But when I went to school, I had to use the outhouse. And it wasn't the best thing in the world. But you know what? Today, I thank God for that outhouse. And I thank God for Rosenwald School because it has made me who I am today. Sometimes you gotta go through something to appreciate something. And that's just one of the things that we had to go through every time we had to go. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to, we decided that we were going to um, put on an, an addition and we have a pic picture of uh, the projected new addition, but that's gonna have the bathrooms in there it's going to have a little pantry area there, and, and that's, this is the building that we're pro proposing. That's the architectural work there. So that building is going to be smaller than the main building, so you're not going to be able to see it from the road, but it's going to have the bathrooms. It's going to have a pantry area for you to be able to uh, you know, make small meals and, or you know, put things in the refrigerator. It'll have storage there. And that's where our um, handicap accessibility will come into play. Okay? Now, um, last year we kicked off the phase two part with our window raising. So one of our, our board members came up with this great idea. We had to have these windows installed. We want the community to know we were doing something and we're not sitting on our hands and um, we decided to use it as a fundraiser. So uh, the window raising was our 2017 initiative and it also was our 100th anniversary. So last year the school standing celebrated 100 years of being there and that was enormous celebration for all of us that it was still there and we could be a part of that. So we had 42 windows that uh, we, uh, had 
for sale for donations, and we actually sold all 42 windows through that initiative before the end of the year. And the windows are being uh, are in the process, as I mentioned earlier, of being installed. And this just shows some of them being done. The second initiative that we have uh, will be, for this year, our doors. We have 24, in fact, we have 26 doors in the building. Uh, so we have 24 doors that we are, again, uh, selling for $400 and the two front doors, which I must say have already been sold for $500 each. And we've all already sold um, some of the other regular doors. And for both the doors and the windows, so if you purchase, you happen to purchase one of the two of them, we have name plates that either your name can go on them or somebody that you know that have been there, you want to do it in memory of, or you want to have your name there for posterity's sake, then uh, the little plates will, will be placed on the doors and the windows. We plan uh, in the later summer, maybe early fall, to have a ceremony where if you purchased a window, then you would come in and you would actually install that plate at that window. So um, that is just one of the things that we're using combination of getting the community engaged in the project as well as a fundraising activity. Uh, because as you know, if you're involved in the Fisherman's Museum restoration and even the wonderful festival hall that we're standing in today, it takes money. Uh, as much as people will volunteer their time, if you want it done and you want it done in a reasonable point in time, you have to go in the pocket. And so we have to come up with creative ways to keep things going and make things happen. So uh, with that said, I, I again want to thank you for the support that we've already given, uh, that you've given, and uh, we ask you to continue to think about us, um, mention us to other people in the community. It's amazing how many people outside of this community that wants to help. Uh, this is a part of us. North Thurman County and is also a part of Reville proper because we're all together here. And you come down the road to get down here, you gotta go past Rosenwald School. Wouldn't it be nice for it to be a wonderful building that, that enhances your community? So we want to do that together. We want to partner with you to do that together. And it is with great pleasure I introduce to you uh, again, our leader, our president, Ms. Mary Jackson, to wrap us up. Thank you, Brenda. Um, I think all has been said um, that needs to be said to give you an idea of what we are attempting to do. As Brenda just mentioned, this is not a foundation project. It is not a black project. It is a community project. This will enhance the Reed Bell area. It's his history. Uh, it would become possibly um, a site to be visited. The county can benefit from it. However, we have not been able to engage the county at this point, uh, but we're not gonna give up on that end either. We will continue to try to engage them. There are schools all across the country, maybe one, there aren't that many still standing, but the ones that have been able to be restored other areas it has been done. There's a scrapple school that's been um, finished, that has uh, been restored. There's a school in Gloucester uh, that's restored. I don't know if it's 100% yet, but they are restoring. As Brenda uh, Stanley indicated, this school is the oldest and one of the seven that was built with this design. 
I cannot understand why someone would not want to be a part of the history and bringing that school back. I, I have some selfish reasons, but a lot of us in here who attended that school probably feel the same way. I lived at the end of North Dublin County, up in Calio area, 32 miles a day, one way. I had a 64 mile round trip every day. Past high school's on my way, but I could not stop. So, and there are several of us who experienced the same thing. Um, not only that, I, this school has graduated some prominent people. Um, the first black pilot for FedEx came out of this school. Uh, we had the uh, secretary treasurer of uh, Philip Morris that came out of this school. There are many others, and I never talk about this, and most people don't know it, but I was one of the first black females to work in the office setting at Martin Marietta. That was my first job, with a top secret clearance. So, and there are many others who have followed the same path. The school, the teachers were dedicated. They took time with each student. They encouraged you to do what you needed to do, and nothing was impossible for you to do. And that's what most of the kids who went to that school came away with. Um, the outhouse bit that Brenda, <laughs> that Brenda mentioned, there were many days that I didn't think I was going to make it home by the time the bus, because I just refused to go. <laughs> and that's, that's a fact. I refused to go. Um, this, we are attempting to make this a community center at a museum, and that will encompass everybody in the community. The money part of this is the problem. To restore the school, it's not going to be cheap. We're looking well over a million dollars, and could be more to get it to the condition that we want it. The school is not in such bad shape, but there are several things that we need to do because there was a group that came from Preservation, Virginia, I believe it was, who visited that school, and they were amazed at the interior of the school. One of the blackboards still in there, they were astonished of the condition of the school. And as someone said earlier, I think the hay being in there helped to preserve it. So, we are asking the community, if you will join us, your donations are important, but we also need volunteers. As I mentioned earlier, Jude is a dedicated volunteer. She gives religiously of her time. We would invite you to volunteer, we need um, people who will do community outreach. Uh, we need a secretary. Tom is our secretary at the present time, and he, do, he does a very good job. Um, <laughs> yes, most, most men don't want to be called secretary, so, but, but he, he does a good job. Um, we need uh, people to serve in different, we need additional board members, and we would love to have you. Um, if you're interested in becoming a board member, we would like to know, and there is a form that you complete, uh, and then we bring you before the board, and a vote is taken. Um, 
anything that you can do to help this effort will be greatly appreciated. Well, first, thank you so much for the discussion here. We've learned a lot. And what I'd like to do is, if there's any questions, uh, let me bring the microphone. I mean, for, for future generations, why don't you just build another outhouse? <laughs> I don't know if a lot of folks here know that there's a um, Virginia tourism initiative trying to bring tourist dollars to help us do some um, work in the greater Reedville community and the Reedville Fisherman's Museum is, is, seems to be taking a bit of a lead with this. We're also hoping to partner with um, the Rosenwald school folks who have been attending the meetings with us. But um, we're looking to get together and, and cooperate on this and other projects. One of the ideas that came up at our last meeting that our director, um, Lee Langston uh, Harrison, came up with was a partnership on our big 4th of July here in Reedville. And the idea is that this is one of the, the big events of the year for Reedville. And we happen to have a block of time in the middle of uh, early afternoon where we that's not booked. We've got um, a, a race in the morning. We've got family activities at the museum um, in the in the early you know before noon. But from about noon to three, we don't have any activity going on before the big parade. So we were thinking that if there was an event on the grounds at the Rosenwald School, that that would bring the community from the museum down to the Rosenwald School and, and, then, and then join the parade back into Reedville. And so we thought there might be some ideas developed around that um, and, and there's, there's a lot of possibilities that can be discussed on what could happen at that event. You know, you could have displays um, to promote the school. You might have a, 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 a cooking contest. Um, you could have vendors there. I know I spoke with someone from um, Curry and Curry who said she would be interested in coming. So there's a lot of different ideas and that would be a really wonderful way to get community attention because it's a big day anyway, so. I'm sorry, I'm, pardon? Recess at Rosenfall, Rosenwald would be wonderful. So, and I'm Kim Schmidt with the Reedville Fisherman's Museum. Uh, we are making plans for the 4th of July. Uh, I'm not sure how much of that was addressed at our meeting. We had a board meeting before this. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to get there in time. And I, I need to mention as well, the majority of the board members here, everyone lives out of town, uh, Stanley, and Marlene Howard, who's not here, but the rest of us live out. Brenda comes from West Virginia, and we drive down for meetings or whatever activity uh, we need to attend. There's no reimbursement for anything. So um, it's dedication and commitment. But we are making plans for the 4th of July to partner with you. I'm wondering why that iconic uh, building, which is the only one that now remains, wasn't restored into its former uh, architecture. Was it just the cost? I'm sorry, I missed something. The former, the, the original architecture is so lovely and so iconic. I'm wondering why your restoration isn't more in line with the former iconic architecture? Is it just for the funds that are required for that? The, the plan is to, okay. the plan is to restore it as close to its original uh, condition 
as possible. We, that's why we chose to put the bathrooms in a separate building outside of the school, the main part of the school, because we didn't have bathrooms there initially. In order to install bathrooms in the building, we would have to take away some of the space, the original space. So we are definitely uh, restoring it based on the historical preservation guidelines. And uh, we're trying to use as much of the original materials, the windows that uh, we are installing are the original windows. So we are doing that, in fact. So the picture of the restored building is not the front, but the side, is that correct? Uh, the one in the center, yes, is to show the addition in the back. Ah, thank you. Yes, uh, we plan to, um, as you can see, we plan, the only thing that we are challenged right now with restoring back, back to its original state is the steeple. That is the challenge that we have. However, um, if funding allows us, we will find an architect that can design that and we'll find somebody to build it. But our goal is to restore back to its original state as much as possible. Hopefully that answered your question. Hi, what challenges are you facing? I'm hearing somewhat present um, with the county in terms of support for this project. Well, um, right now we are, I think, aligned with the county. Uh, we, we're not getting county funding, but we have met with the uh, Board of Supervisors and we have, uh, in fact, our architect, myself, and Mr. Samuel Key, uh, we went there and we have presented the plan and uh, they have given us the guidance that we need to do to follow in order to get it uh, fully approved and uh, the buy-in there. We were challenged earlier just because of the fact that they only have one or two people. They don't have a large staff there. And it, it was just hard for us to get an audience. But we were finally able to get an audience and uh, I think we'll move forward now. Uh, the architect is going to... I have made requests from the board for funds and assistance. So we haven't gotten that approved yet, but we are there. We're front and center. They know who we are, uh, and we'll continue to work in that direction. But if you happen to know somebody, pull the coattail and let them know. Any other questions? Just another comment. Um, I met a gal from Curry and Curry, um, that I was mentioning a little while ago in Whitestone, um, I think last weekend, her father, I believe, was a graduate. They're naming a park after him in, in Kilmarnock. And she said that either he or one of her relatives was part of the, was one of the chanty singers. And since I've come to Reedville, I've really hoped to hear them. And I wondered whether someone might get a few of our remaining chanty singers to perhaps come to the 4th of July event. So there's a suggestion you might look into. That would be certainly quite um, of interest, you know, public interest, and, and probably get quite a few folks to come. I was pleased that you've been in touch with the state restoration folks. Uh, did they discuss with you any possibility of grants or what, at what stage you might apply for some restoration funding? Okay. Um, I have the biggest mouth, so I guess I'll ask the question. Um, we have been, well, in fact, they, we have received one grant from them already. Uh, we are constantly looking at other opportunities and not only through the uh, National Historical Preservation, the state as well, uh, to support what we're trying to do. Um, unfortunately, even though every dime helps, uh, 
they require a lot of matching funds and, and the amounts are relatively low. Um, so we, we, we do take advantage of that opportunity whenever we can get it. Um, but we, we really need some real money now. Um, $4,000 gets us a little bit towards the mission, but not where we need to be. So we, we have looked at that, we have taken advantage of that. We're also looking at a lot of the other grants that are available, and we're, we're trying to apply for everything we can. In fact, we made a decision in, in today's meeting that even with, if it doesn't look like we qualify for the grant, we're gonna apply for them anyway. All they're gonna tell us is no, right? But you don't know until you try. So we, we're definitely um, pursuing those avenues. Thank you so much for mentioning that. Any other questions? I wonder what your vision is for the inside of the building. How, how do you picture how the inside is going to look? Well, as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we want to set this up as a community center portion of it, and the other part of it will be a museum. And that museum uh, not, doesn't uh, necessarily include all blacks, um, but that's, that's what our goal is, to have a museum and also have a community center that could be used by the com community for different events. I, I understand that, but the, the, um, uh, space, the space itself, does that mean it will be, you'll be doing just the ground floor and you'll be dividing it in half? You'll be using the uh, uh, second floor for a different oh. task? I'm sorry? we will be using all of the space. We haven't decided as to which space, well, I think we have decided as far as the museum, uh, which space would be used. Uh, but Brenda can address that. Uh, we're going to, let me help you visualize, because I'm a very visual person, so I like to, just wanna get that sound so we don't clash. Uh, when you go into the, main, in the, to the building, there is a um, classroom to the left of the main door and a classroom to the right. Yeah. Stop. Okay. So when you go here, we plan for this room here to be the museum. And we do have a picture of how that would look. And on the other side would be an area where we, you could go in and um, actually see a classroom set up. In other words, we want to make sure we get the, the boards restored, some desks in there, so you can kind of get the feel of a class um, in the school. So those are the two main things we want to do with the, the, the main area, and this is how the museum would look, or a future design of the museum itself with the shelves. And, that's where you could listen to your, the art history, um, the oral histories that have been done, and we've done quite a few of those, um, uh, and all the artifacts that we have saved, saved over time and things of that nature. So two things for sure will be just used for people to come and see. And then the back of the school, still on the first floor, is uh, a, a room that has a movable door that opens that up. That used to be the old auditorium. And we could have a uh, small banquet, some things like this in there. And then we have the classrooms upstairs, which could be used as uh, office, office space. It could be used for smaller meetings. It could use, be used for uh, classes, uh, anything of that nature. So. But we planned on uh, restoring the whole building and actually utilizing all of the space in that building. And do you have a foundation set up for the, for the actual? Uh, do you have, is there, <coughs> do you plan on your foundation continuing to add support? Because after the building is done, and in order to continue the programming, you have to have a lot of support there as well. That's in place. Absolutely. It would transition from uh, the mission being more of a restoration mission, 
In fact, we have changed our mission once because initially our mission was the acquisition of the building, being able to get the building in our possession so that we could do something with that. So we accomplished that mission. Hey, yay! Thank you, Tom and the Slaughter family. And then, so then the second part of that it is to now restore. Same foundation, different mission. And once the restoration has been completed, then the next mission will be the sustainability of the building to continue to function as a community center and, and other museum. Well, thank you very much. Before we, we close, when I mentioned volunteers, I left out one person who has been extremely helpful to us all through this um, uh, event, and that's Miss Lois Tolson. And she is actually a historian. She has provided enormous information that we probably would not have been aware of and Eloise, I just want to thank you, and also Mr. William Taylor, who is very helpful to us. So we want, we want to thank both of them, and uh, we will not forget you. We love you.